Little Chicago. Just one of many labels the city of Youngstown has worn over the years. Steeltown was the most noble. It reflected the very essence of this community. Its strong ethnic mix produced a tough blue-collar class of people who worked hard by day and played just as hard by night. To liken a small city like Youngstown to a major one might engender a burst of civic pride. But the analogy to Chicago was not meant to be complimentary. It's just that both cities were infested with murderous gangsters. <laughs> Big Chicago had Al Capone. He considered himself a modern-day Robin Hood. Capone provided bootleg whiskey to people who preferred partying to Prohibition and soup kitchens to the down and out during the Depression. The former bodyguard and hitman rose to power by first rubbing out those he was hired to protect and then anyone else who got in his way, giving all a lavish send-off. The gangland-style killings here in the early 60s were far less frequent than those in Capone's days, but every bit as brutally violent. Youngstown's really going downhill, but you just don't hear very many nice things about it anymore. The people from out of town really, like she said, think it's Little Chicago. A writer proclaimed that crime was to Youngstown what movies were to Hollywood and cars to Detroit. In the early days, a man known as public enemy number one in Buffalo, before authorities there ran him out of town, settled here. Joe the Wolf DiCarlo tied up with local hood Jasper Fats Alio, setting up a horse betting and numbers racket. From Michigan to Trumbull County came another nationally known criminal, Frank Camarada, a member of Detroit's notorious Purple Gang. He tried to muscle in on the lucrative jukebox trade here, but was driven off by local thugs with similar interests. And then there was Warren Kingpin, Tony the Dope Del Center, and his two powerful underlings, John and Mike Farah. The Farahs ran a celebrated gambling casino, the Jungle Inn, in a place called Hall's Corners in Liberty Township, just outside the Youngstown city limits. Well, they had a cage, and they had a guy up there with a machine gun, and the fellow that up there was the machine gun's an old acquaintance of mine, Danny Canonico, who's since died, sat up there in the turret with the gun, and he, he was there to protect it. Uh, those places are always subject to being heisted. Big winners, especially the ladies, were safely escorted home by Jungle Inn strong arms, just in case any robbers were lurking, or any gambling loser who might try to recover outside what he dropped at the tables inside. The valley was wide open then, with Youngstown leading the way. But that would suddenly change. During the post-war years, gambling, prostitution, extortion were running rampant in the area. But in a pang of conscience in 1947, Youngstown elected Republican Charles P. Henderson mayor. Along with his police chief, Edward Allen, they had campaigned on a pledge to clean up the town and restore its respectability. Their slogan, Smash Rackets Rule. They got the local phone company to literally pull the plug on Joe DiCarlo's horse race wire service that operated in bookie joints fronted by seemingly legitimate businesses. Allen and Vice Chief Dan Magnetti had flying squads round up the numbers runners, bug men, as they were called. They put such a crimp into Carlo's gambling operation that he left town, fled to Miami. But Chief Allen's biggest coup came where he had no jurisdiction. He convinced state authorities to launch a massive raid at the Jungle Inn in August of 49. The raid almost touched off a gun battle between lawmen and thugs inside. One was ordered by John Farah to start shooting. He thought better of it and didn't. All gambling equipment was smashed or confiscated, and the Jungle Inn was shut down by agents as a fire trap for various building code violations. Allen and Henderson claimed victory in some battles during their six years in office, but when they left in 1953, Allen admitted they hadn't won the war. He noted that the criminal element was deeply rooted here and chastised city residents for being willing participants. A local mob expert agrees. Who is responsible ultimately is the public. If the public doesn't want gambling, you're not going to have gambling. If there's a market, that market is going to be met because it is a profitable one. Allen also blasted politicians who, if not controlled by the gangsters, he said, 
were reluctant to take a public stand against them. He even skewered Congressman Mike Kerwin of Valley Sacred Cow, who introduced a bill in Congress to block the deportation of Frank Camarada, by then a rising mafia don. Critics called it a stinker bill because it reeked of mob influence. Kerwin admitted doing so at the request of a friend of the Licavoli crime family in Cleveland. Ironically, as Henderson and Allen knocked down the big gambling operations and houses of ill repute run by the few, the many began to scramble for a small piece of what was left. The 50s were marked by no less than 80 unsolved bombings. Two-thirds of them occurred outside the city, and its new leader felt that Youngstown got a bum rap and a new demeaning name, Bombtown. In my first year in office, there were some bombings. And when they added them up, they claimed that there was 30-some bombings. Gee, 30 bombings in the area, and I think we only had three or four actually in the city. Most of the city's bombings in the 50s caused minor damage and rarely any injuries. But that would change drastically as Youngstown closed out the decade. City voters raised some eyebrows by electing ex-judge Frank Franco as mayor shortly after he'd been thrown off the city bench for fixing parking tickets. Word quickly spread that the city would be wide open again, and that could spell serious trouble. Even before Franco took office, a bomb blast rocked the city's north side, and Youngstown's sordid reputation moved up a notch on the scale of shame from Bombtown, Ohio, to Murdertown, USA. <laughs> Youngstown's first gangland-style killing took the life of Christopher Cleus of Camel in May of 59. He had just left the apartment of a lady friend on Park Avenue when he was blown away in a car bombing. Among those questioned in the bombing, rising Struthers Rackets figure, Ronnie Carabia. He too apparently knew the woman, dubbed the aluminum blonde by the press because of the striking color of her hair. Carabia and Sophocleus allegedly had a fist fight over the blonde. He was never charged in the Sophocleus slaying. Lonnie Carabia is now serving a life sentence in the car bombing death of Cleveland mobster Danny Green in the 70s. Still others thought the killing of Sophocleus may have been linked to an underworld fight for control of Barboot. That's a fast-paced, high-stakes dice game that produced huge revenues to finance mob activities and buy influence. The case was never solved. Oh, some Greek outfit here had Barboot at one time and that. But as these mob outfits came in, they started taking over. With the muscle they had, they didn't have much trouble getting them out of the way. A year later, late winter of 1960, one of the most sensational gangland killings in local history took place. It claimed the life of racketeer S. Joseph Naples. Everybody called him Sandy. He'd done a long stretch in prison for severely beating a man during a robbery that netted just $2.12. Sandy made big headlines in 1958 while serving a gambling sentence in the Mahoney County Jail. He was caught slipping out on weekends to see his girlfriend. It was going to see her, Marianne Verensage, that led to Sandy's demise. Old timers said you could set your watch by him. Every night about 11, he'd arrive on her front porch on Caledonia Street on the city's south side. That night, two hitmen stepped out from the shadows and gunned him down. Marianne had just opened the door to greet him. She, too, was killed by gunfire. I attempted to talk to him. He appeared serious. However, I thought she would, uh, she would survive and we'd be able to talk with her at a later date. And, uh, she also expired. But this is where the scene was. And she was outside the door, and he was lying right in here, partially behind this rail. Sandy did not go quietly. He emptied his 38 snub nosed revolver, but police couldn't find any blood trail to indicate that he'd hit either of his fleeing assassins. A shotgun left at the scene and a machine gun found two years later in a nearby storm sewer were linked to the slayings, but nothing ever came of it. Charlie Carabia was one of many possible suspects questioned in the Naples hit. No one was ever charged. <laughs> Following the slaying of Sandy Naples, the mob killing field shifted from Youngstown to Trumbull County. During the summer of 61, another member of the racket's hierarchy fell victim to a shotgun blast. Mike Farah of Jungle Inn fame was peppered with pellets outside his home in Warren. He was practicing some golf shots on his front lawn when a gunman fired from the back seat of a car that sped around the corner and kept going. The rumor mill had it the Cleveland gambling interests who were trying to muscle in may have knocked off Farah. The only thing certain, the one-time king of the jungle would prowl Trumbull County no more.
with Farah's demise, the murder scene again shifted back to Youngstown and the method of killing chains from shotguns back to bombs. Target acknowledged gambling overlord Vince De Niro. He had turned himself in for questioning in the Sandy Naples robot more than a year earlier. It had been rumored then that Naples had his eyes on De Niro's gambling empire with intentions of moving up. But if there was a connection, it couldn't be proven then. He was released without charge. De Niro owned Cicero's restaurant here on the south side. It was torched in later years, but it was very much a part of the bustling uptown section in July of 61. De Niro left the restaurant that summer night, crossed Market Street to his parked convertible, turned the key in the ignition, and was blown to bits. The force of the blast so severe it shattered plate glass windows in 20 nearby businesses and shook homes for blocks around. One of the car's fenders was found on a nearby rooftop. A curious crowd quickly gathered to see what they had heard, some coming from miles away. It was a Sunday night, and authorities noted that if the blast had occurred earlier, it might have caught the crowd leaving the nearby uptown theater. As it turned out, no one else was hurt or killed. Riding high in the prime of his life, Vince De Niro was suddenly gone. He was just 39. A year later, the tit-for-tat theories surrounding the Naples De Niro slaying surfaced once again. A younger brother of Sandy Naples, Billy, was mangled in a car bombing on Madison Avenue on the north side. The blast said to be more powerful than the one that killed De Niro. A fireman who responded from a station house right across the street remembers it well. We seen some flames coming out from the garage. Got closer there and looked, and they said there was somebody in the car. Didn't know who it was or what happened here. And you, later, you knew Billy, though, didn't you? He lived across the street from us, but I didn't recognize him there. I didn't know who it was until later, and they told me who it was. Billy Naples was armed with a loaded revolver when the end came and was clad in dark clothing. He wore black leather gloves, although it was summertime. Police speculated Naples may have been going out on a hit or a burglary and was double-crossed. There had been a number of safe crackings then. Billy had been driven to his rig car by Dominic Moyo, a known bomb expert and arsonist from the Canton area. He became the prime suspect, but was never charged. With Sandy and Billy now gone, control of the Naples family passed to its youngest member, little Joey. I think it's a shame that the racketeers want to kill each other. It's all right with me. Let them go and kill themselves, I think. Youngstown would be a better place to live. As the bodies of gangland violence continued to pile up, citizens grew weary of the carnage and all but immune to the gruesome scenes of slaughter. But even the most hardened among them were not prepared for what happened four months after the Billy Naples slaying. The crime that shook the nation occurred at the north side home of Cadillac Charlie Caballero the day after Thanksgiving. Caballero was a self-proclaimed grape salesman, but police believe that he had mafia ties. He planned to drive from his home here on Roslyn Drive downtown to pay a bill and drop two of his young sons off at football practice along the way. When the three climbed into the car and Caballero turned on the ignition, a tremendous explosion shook the neighborhood, all but disintegrated the car and collapsed the garage, killing Caballero and his 11-year-old son, Tommy. Somehow, 12-year-old Chucky Caballero miraculously survived, though maimed for life with a severe hip injury. People were outraged. I think it's terrible. It's really a shame that it had to happen to somebody that young, someone who really doesn't even know what's going on yet. Caballero bombing deaths drew nationwide attention at a time when Attorney General Robert Kennedy was convening a crime commission who wanted to expose and try to stamp out mafia activity in this country. Forty FBI agents flooded the city of Youngstown and sifted through three years of gangland killing evidence. They allegedly offered one potential snitch a stack of money to tell what he knew, but he wouldn't talk. He said, if you give me money from the floor up to my chin, he said, I can't tell you because I'd never live to spend it. They'll tell you off the record, but they will never go in to testify. So unless you got evidence, there's nothing you can do. The FBI had a reputation of solving 19 of 20 cases, and the man who spearheaded the Caballero investigation here was confident, even though the trail was growing cold. We don't give up on these cases. Once it's open, we continue it uh, really forever. Uh, for instance, it took us uh, some six years to solve the Brinks case, which we worked continuously for that period of time. And we intend to work this one until we come up to a solution. But despite good intentions, like all the other gangland hits here, the Cavalero bombing was never solved. Or was it? 
Nearly a year after the Caballero bombing, the charred body of a man was found at a strip mine south of Canton. It was stuffed into the burned out trunk of an abandoned car. The victim shot in the head. It took fingerprints to identify the body as that of Dominic Moyo, the hitman for hire suspected in both the De Niro and Naples bombing deaths. Lawmen speculated the mob itself put out a contract on Moyo for botching the Cavallero job by inadvertently involving two innocent children. And so it was in Youngstown in the early 60s. Several years of senseless bloodshed finally brought to a close, but only at the cruel expense of one young life and the maiming of another. For TV 27's First News, I'm Tom Holden.